Okay, welcome everybody. This is Adam Holt speaking. I want to thank you personally for attending our webinar today. It's part of an ongoing series we've been trying to put together to commit to our financial advisor community to learning new and different ideas and perspectives. And one of the things that we realized um, several times, several years ago, actually, is that we, we always found great insight when we brought someone who was from outside of our world. Um, and today, I actually asked Ramsey Smith uh, to join us. Uh, and so thank you, Ramsey, for being here. Adam, thank you very much for, for having me here. I'm looking forward to our conversation and, uh, you know, have admired your work. So thank you. Well, it's interesting. Um, just to give you some background for those of you that don't know us, um, my name is Adam Holtz. I'm a financial planner by trade, been in the business for 21 years. I came up with a process called Asset Map a bunch of years ago, and it kind of took off virally as many advisors realized that visualizing what was going on in households' lives really was the compelling part of their value proposition. Um, I came across Ramsey through my, tra my travels and, my, and, and spending a lot of time now in the industry. Uh, and Ramsey is one of those people that you probably all have uh, experienced that just intrigues you, someone who really understands at a different level a part of the business. And, and it really comes back to his background, um, obviously having a fantastic uh, educational background, Ivy League educated, as you told me, uh, a rower, as we just learned, a fellow yeah, rower, yeah. Um, although we were on different teams, um, and then also um, having been uh, having been at Goldman Sachs in the derivative space. And so do me a favor, help us understand kind of how you got into the work you're doing right now before we get into the meat of our presentation. Absolutely. Thanks, Adam. So I spent uh, 21 years at Goldman Sachs, and the last 10 of those years, uh, I uh, built a business that focused on the life insurance space. And it originally started uh, helping large insurance companies hedge uh, their, their risk from their variable annuity books. Over time, that business transitioned into uh, helping the carriers build different and better products. And you might have seen that in the form of fixed index annuities that have customized indices. Um, as, as time went on and we were getting closer and closer to the end user, um, we, uh, we had the I had the opportunity in particular to get closer to the distribution channel and closer to the people that actually use these products. And uh, several things sort of came to mind. One was that, um, that, that perhaps there was an opportunity to, to focus on simpler products instead of continually trying mm -hmm. to create uh, a new and new and interesting alternatives, which unfortunately bring with them complexities that, uh, that create other issues. Boy, well, I certainly know about that. I mean, yeah. having been a field advisor for many years, those products got so complicated that we found we were actually having to resell them year over year to help people understand what they bought. So thanks for creating that that complexity. <laughs> it's your fault. Well, the time I, I, I'm I'm very proud of the work we did, and I think that sometimes sometimes complex problems need complex solutions. I think everybody's gone the route of trying to fix fix things with complexity. I think we've underutilized the opportunity to fix these fix these problems and opportunities with simplicity. Very good. Well, we certainly agree here at Asset Map. In fact, we've been trying to get to a one or two page presentation for many years. And as long as the compliance organizations support it, we're happy to communicate simply. Um, so for our agenda, we're going to keep to our 30 minutes, as I said. Um, the structure of it is the following. We're going to talk about annuities in the mainstream and what's coming and what's modern, um, as well as how to actually approach this conversation uh, with our consumers today. And we're going to spend some time. We've had a lot of requests to show how you would communicate the uh, income distribution challenge in asset map how do you do that in one page how do you do that on one screen so we're going to take about 10 minutes towards the end and we'll share that if you do have questions throughout please take the time to fill out the questions uh, section on the right and we'll be sure to try to answer them in line or at the end of the program so i saw this actually uh on your on your um site ramsey uh alex.fyi and i thought this was really interesting Talk, walk me through what you were really trying to communicate here? Well, the, the, the main thing was to, to illustrate that the retirement problem is real, it's significant, it is, uh, it is something that we see across the developed world. So in this chart, you've got everything from the, the, the US all the way to the Netherlands and, and UK and Japan. And uh, if you look specifically at the, um, at the US bar, you can see that, 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 the, that the, average, the average American is uh, is is well underprepared from a financial perspective relative to uh, relative to what their expected retirement needs are, and so it's 
eight years for the typical male and, and 11 years for the typical female. And that's obviously because of differences in life expectancy. Mm -hmm. But the other thing to pay attention to here that's really kind of interesting is look at, look at what the situation is like in Japan. Mm -hmm. And you know, that may be a glimpse of what the future looks like for us as our population continues to, to age. They're probably you know, two or three decades ahead of where we are, but that's, that's where the future lies. Interesting, you're saying because the demographic challenges in Japan, there's such an aging population there that they're already in a situation where they only have four and a half years of savings relative to the potential 20 years they live. That's right. Gosh, amazing. You can see one of the problems that comes up. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about demographics and what's, what's really affecting. What are you seeing on your side, especially with the perspective of the annuity market is place. Well, how does that, how's that affected and what's, how is it being challenged by the demographics? So uh, the, 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 the key issue is this, we are all living longer than we used to. There's been a little bit of a reversal since the opioid, opioid epidemic, came, epidemic came about, but for the most part, Americans are living much longer than they used to. We have a retirement support system that you know, whether you're talking about social security or defined benefit pension plans, that was designed for a population that wasn't living nearly this long. And we also have the issue that, that those support systems are essentially disappearing. So pension plans, as we know, have, have largely gone the way of the dinosaur. Social security is this amazing benefit, but it has a cap on it, let's call it a ceiling, which is far more likely to go down from here on in than to, than, than to go up. And so that is creating a, 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 an important sense of sort of real pressure, but it's also creating sort of an emotional pressure and anxiety um, that, uh, that, that, that a lot of consumers are starting to feel. And we're seeing that in the conversations that we would have with consumers at, at Alex.FYI, particularly, particularly since we, we got some very favorable press coverage at the end of last year. We had a lot of incoming calls. The market was going through a rough, a rough, uh, a rough period at the tail end, of, tail end of 2018. And conversation after conversation uh, that we had followed a very similar line. Mm -hmm. You had people that had made many right decisions in terms of the accumulation of their, of their retirement nest egg, but they had a great deal of uncertainty about how they were gonna make it last you know, over the course of the remainder of their lifetime. So they had a large sum of money that was essentially entirely at risk. Mm -hmm. And um, they were looking for, they were looking for solutions to, to have um, uh, more guaranteed sources of income. And it was a very, also very interesting bifurcation. When I talked to people that had pension plans, mm -hmm. so two people with the same net worth and the lucky few that actually had sort of strong, solid defined benefit pension plans were far more relaxed than the people that didn't. And it was it was yeah. a very it was a palpable a palpable difference. That's interesting you say yeah. that. I to, not to cut you off. I mean, the reality is that my experience, having come from the field as opposed to from the product yeah. side, is that the the happiest and least anxious clients we had were almost entirely teachers, military, mm -hmm. and government employees. And why? It's because they had pensions that significantly covered their core costs. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, mo many of the wealthiest clients that we have even today, uh, still make different decisions in their daily behavior based upon what the market is doing. There, we have a, a fun situation with one of our classic clients over the years who had basically said that she wouldn't go to dinner with her girlfriends uh, because Bloomberg told her that the market was down a whole week in a row and she, you know, she was worried about running out of money. So there's, there's no question that it actually affects the anxiety levels. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and kind of what, what are these, how we should be using these tools. Um, interestingly enough, you know, we talked about in our private conversation that decumulation is one of these big challenges that I think a lot of advisors and professionals are going to really have trouble with. I, I just spoke this morning at Wharton, and we talked a lot about how um, how probably the bigger effort that an advisor is really going to have to make over the next 20 years is really on how to manage the distribution of that wealth and how to make decisions in an environment where interest rates are really strange. Yeah. Talk to me about what's uh, kind of what's what are you seeing in that conversation around dec decumulation? So I think that there's a there's a broader refocus. We've had an entire um, we've had an entire um, I'll call it uh, culture of saving for retirement. So in the past we've talked about you know what's your number? Mm. That's always been that lump sum number, and the future hopefully is not talking about what that lump sum number is. It, instead, it's talking about what is that. What is that guaranteed number per per month or year that I need to actually cover my expenses? So it's, it's a switch from a nest egg number to a to a, a an income number is going to be a very very important development. So yeah. part of that is just sort of I would say uh, it, it is culture, um, but the other part of it is of course 
practical is a lot more people that are retiring and of those people that are retiring fewer of them have the fewer of them are actually realizing that they that they don't have guaranteed income yeah. it's one thing to know it intellectually when right. you're 40 or 45 it's another thing to be on the precipice of retirement and having one of those i'll say aw shucks because we're on right. <laughs> <laughs> one of those aw shucks moments and realizing this is real yeah. and, and and that's precisely why for you know for our business we're focusing on people in the 55 to 75 range mm -hmm. because when i talk to somebody at age 45 they're not quite feeling that pain yet yeah. unless it's on behalf of their parents and that's another conversation right, right. yeah but um but for for the person that's close to retirement, that realization is there. And there's also this important element of, of knowledge. So at 55 or 60, you, you know more or less, where am I gonna live when I'm 65? You know, you know what sources of guaranteed income I do or don't have. You know, what your, um, you know what your nest egg is. You actually have some kind of visibility into what your, what your expenses are likely to be. And you've probably gotten past a lot of those sort of large, one-time expenses like sending kids to college, et cetera. Weddings so, such, yeah. Yeah, exactly, and weddings and such. So it's actually a very, very good time to start thinking about that. And, it, and, and to your point, it is very, very hard. And it's not just people like you and me that think that, but like there's plenty of Nobel laureates and economists that will describe it as the single most difficult problem in finance. Well, it's interesting, to, kind of taking that a step further, you mentioned something to me in, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago about how um, how you previously had looked at risk and managing this as a as an almost an academia. Yeah. Talk to me about this idea of right and wrong way of risk because this was a new concept to me. Okay, it's a great great question. So, um, at my old employer, mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs, uh, we uh, we obviously spent a lot of time talking about risk. It was something that was very well discussed and was part of the culture. And um, one of the key things, not just there, but in general, you know, in, when you're in the um, in the risk management business, is you know understanding the difference between what a model might might tell you and what happens in in, in the real world. And uh, and and, I, and for me, the longevity question kind of fits nicely into this into this discussion. So if you think about if you think about what the risk is of outliving your assets. Um, you are in a position, let's say you're 80 or 90 years old, you are in a position where you will have less opportunities to correct any mistakes that you might have, correct any mistakes that you might have, that you might have mm -hmm. made, right? You will probably have a hard time getting a job. You will probably, um, you will probably have a difficult time finding other ways of getting, of, get, of finding assets. You'll probably have to rely on some third party, whether it's the government or your family or whoever else. Right, right, right. So you, in, in, a, in a place where you have lived a healthy life mm -hmm. and have the right genetics and happen to live long, that's a fantastic outcome from a personal perspective, but it's a real financial, it's a, re, it's a real financial burden. So longevity is right way risk, if you will, for on a personal level, but it's wrong way risk on a financial level. So how do you fix that? Well, one way you can fix that is by buying longevity protection. And here's the interesting thing, is a longevity protection kicks in precisely in the in the you know at the time and the place where you need it right. if instead you invest in um you invest in assets that are at risk mm -hmm. they can go up they can go down you might have issues of sequence of returns etc mm -hmm. it may happen that at the time you need those assets those assets are not performing right. there's no direct relationship between the market performance other than sort of a you know, a trend over time that's upward through the market performance in your personal outcome. Got it. So here with a, with a with an income annuity, which is a pure play on longevity, right? You have perfect correlation between your need and your answer. Got it. Very interesting. You know, it's interesting because when you think about that, I like the I like the perspective of right and wrong way risk. I mean, obviously the incentive is I want to live a long life, as you said. Um, but clearly, as the longer I live, the more of these risks pop up. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that many of us have actually dealt with them personally, mm -hmm. especially in the advisory world, although many of us have dealt with it with our parents and grandparents and seeing what that meant, right? We, yeah. Right, we want to we want to have these long, healthy lives. And then, of course, oh, my gosh, how are we going to afford such a such yeah. a blessing, right? Um, and one of these topics that comes up, I think, in our industry a lot, I know a lot of other speakers are talking about this idea of mortality credits and, and you mentioned something about survivor credits and this is an interesting way to, to communicate this sure. to consumers of why does this even make sense because there is certainly a lot of 
we'll call it negativity or bad press around these words, as I know you've written recently to Ken Fisher sure. about. Um, and so talk to me a little bit about how we should look at this from a mortality versus survivor credit discussion. So um, I, I get in a lot of conversations with consumers about whether they should, um, uh, one, first of all, one is how can, the, how, can the, how can an insurance company pay more than what they're you know, earning presumably on, uh, on, uh, from their, their, their backing portfolio, from the, their fixed income portfolio. I also get asked a lot of questions about you know, what the internal rate of return is. Lots of, there's, lots of, there's lots of focus on this, um, uh, on this discussion as if it were an investment. And the main thing is to get people to focus on it as, as an sort of insurance against a risk. That's the first element. Mm. Um, second element is that the uh, in the business, the technical term for you know for how these are how the, how these are priced is morta mort mortality credits, right? Yeah. So you've got you've got obviously you've got the interest return from the backing portfolio, mm -hmm. and then you have this idea that everybody is in a pool. Some people are going to live to 90 years old. Some people are going to pass you know at, at an earlier age, and the uh, and, and that difference in those differences in sort of mortality and life expectancy are reflected in the payouts and those are called mortality credits but i think from a from a communication perspective to your point mm -hmm. um, i think it's it's interesting to call them survivor credits because at the end of the day you know when you really see the benefit of of um uh, of investing in an annuity like economically mm -hmm. it's going to be when you live past the average life expectancy of the poor got so it that's that's so why survive I think, the mortality ta tables is really yeah. where you're getting your your you're big, if you will. That's really the key. I think that's. A, I think that is a. I think that is a powerful way to think about it and communicate it. Yes. You know, you you, you can't really talk about this, and and certainly in a vacuum. A lot of investment advisors, financial planners, and such, you know, having a have a perspective around uh, annuities is a bad word. And um, you know, so depending upon who you talk to or what their life's experience has been, if it is in fact an investment product, you get certainly mixed responses. So okay. how are how are you dealing with that conversation these days how does a financial professional uh, talk about this product that clearly is a risk product um, in the context of an investment or do that maybe they shouldn't i think as much as possible to the extent that you can sort of separate the separate the discussions i think that's an important opportunity and so the way i typically think about it um, think about it in terms of use cases so let's go back to this issue of anxiety reduction right um, most of the people that, that we speak to, um, mm -hmm. as again, let's say it's a 65 year old, 65 year old female. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we've spoken to that persona many times. We call her Marilyn. Right. And she's 65 years old. She's got, say, a couple of million dollars in her, uh, in her portfolio. Uh, she, uh, she's healthy. Uh, her mother lived to 100 years old. Uh, so she has a very clear view that she's probably got another 35 to 40 years you know, on this earth. Mm -hmm. And she owns her home. She's not made all the right decisions. Um, but again, she has the stress that we were talking about. And to me, the simple, the simple way to sort of essentially like sort of bifurcate the, uh, the issues here is to say, look, Marilyn, tell us what your, tell us what your expenses are your fixed expenses, your non-discretionary expenses, your health insurance costs, your property tax, et cetera. Let's just focus on those. Let's use a simple income annuity to effectively defease just those expenses. And if, if um, you can do that with less than 30% of your income, of course, you've got to net out existing sources of guaranteed income. Right. So you start with what social security, what social security, um, what, what defined benefit plans that she might have, and compare that number to her fixed expenses. If there's a gap, and we can solve that gap with 30% of 30% or less of your assets, then there's a conversation to be had. Okay. And the rest of Maryland's money can be invested in the markets, in the right mix of stocks and bonds, as you know, according to what an advisor yeah. would want. There's no question. I, you know, in terms of kind of what we talked about, with what these annuities are really for, is I actually tend to stop looking at them as investment products, and I think that's really a it's a critical thing because in the investment perspective of it, you know, there's clearly there's an argument that boy, uh, I think I might be able to invest my money long term and do better, but of course there's that uncertainty of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I happen to say that that for the most part. An annuity tool is an anxiety reducer, right? Because it gives me certainty. I tend to tell clients that it's just, it's one of those things that none of us can mess up, right? 
It's the, it's the certainty in the situation that if the markets don't perform or we don't deliver or whatever it might be, that somebody is there making sure that those bills are getting paid. And there's an emotional value to that. Um, one of the things that, that also tends to come up clearly in where these, these annuities are for is really income optimization. And, and in that case, it actually winds up having a really relevant portfolio theory position. Um, talk to me about, you know, you have this fantastic quantitative background, um, you know, yield and price comes up a lot, especially in distribution to accumulation planning. How do you think of these tools uh, with respect to other types of families sure. in income optimization? So I, I, you bring up a, an excellent point. That's sort of the second big use case. So the first use case is, I'll call it income flooring. And the second use case is one that is some sense is more applicable to people that have more assets and are kind of optimizing lifestyle. And you know some of the conversations we've seen, if somebody that's that's quite wealthy and has a an annual budget they would like to support, let's say it's five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars a year, it can be quite substantial. And so in this case, we're talking about not just discret non discretionary expenses, we're talking about lifestyle expenses. And the question comes up is, well, how much money do I need to put up front now to uh, essentially finance this lifestyle for the rest for the rest of my life? And, um, and, and I, as you guys are financial planners, you run it through your systems, you make assumptions about returns to the various assets in the portfolio, and you run a Monte, Monte Carlo analysis. And on the other end, you can determine with you know with X percent probability, um, if you if you if you spend say $500,000 there's a 100% probability you won't run out, of, run out of money based on this budget. If you spend 750, maybe you have a 70% probability right, of success, right. et cetera. And so the, 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 the next phase in my view is instead of just running this analysis with stocks and bonds, put an income annuity into, the, into, this, into this calculus as a substitute for some portion of the, uh, some portion of the, um, uh, of the fixed income portion. Right. And and run your analysis again and see how that actually you know uh, optimizes your outcome outcomes further. Yeah. So it's a different it's a it's a very sort of different use case for a different type of type of client. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, and and for the most part, we are starting to think about this. We've been very you know concerned, of course, with interest rates being low. That certainly does affect obviously income annuities or deferred annuities that are going to be turned into income. Um, and I think uh, obviously. When we talk a lot about sequence of returns to our clients, this really starts to create some really interesting um, mathematical wins relative to a portfolio that doesn't have some kind of income certainty. Um, it's interesting because one of the things that we can show in Asset Map is the impact of earning a different return, right? So when you have a, a fixed annuity, big surprise, even if you increase your expected return on assets, it makes less of a difference on the upside and the downside. Yeah. And I'll actually yeah. try to show that today. Um, and the other things that I think we're coming across is this idea of uh, yield and price and where fixed instruments are going to be. Granted, given interest, interest rates are so low, if we use traditional products on the bond side, or fixed income rather, um, we're going to get crushed for holding some of these assets, especially if we need liquidity. So I think it's really interesting to, to think about some of these things we've listed here in income optimization such as sequence of returns, mm -hmm. that yield price ratio for holding other fixed instruments. Um, what is the credit quality of obviously a, an, an issuing company? Does that come into play? Can I correlate that with the, with the fixed income portfolio? Um, and of course, the exclusion ratio, which is the tax implication. And as we both know, Ramsey, right, the tax implication for non-qualified instruments can be really compelling for families that have seriously high tax brackets. Yeah. And I don't know if you have any comments on that, but that's... Yeah, no, absolutely. That's something that, that comes up in almost every conversation that that, uh, that I have, is that, that uh, many aren't familiar with, one, the concept of qualified versus non-qualified, or even to the extent that they are, they don't necessarily know how that plays out in the con in the uh, in, in the uh, the context of of an income annuity, but it, typically it, it translates into a 60 to 80 percent exclusion for you know a decade or two or three, mm -hmm. and um, and so it ends up being quite quite tax efficient relative relative to a lot of other alternatives. Absolutely right. So that's great, and it's actually a great segue. So you know one of the things that we've been telling people for years is that you know most of us in the professional space we love technicians. Like we're technicians, right? We love the math behind it. Um, certainly, I imagine if you're on this call, you can relate in some measure. 
But what our clients are looking for is certainty. That's why they hire us. Um, they're looking for certainty because they want to make the only decision. There's clearly a high cost of being wrong, as Ramsey said, we can't do over. Uh, and when there's a lot of complexity in these things, we want to actually help them make better decisions. Um, one of the things that we've been asked through throughout the years is, is how do you have this conversation in a, in a Fisher Price way? Right, without getting too technical. And one of the things that we want to show here is that, you know, here's an example of a household that has different kinds of annuities, right? You might see, uh, how do we communicate the fact that we've got a SPIA? How does that play into to consideration here? Well, this is a SPIA from a carrier and it's gonna generate 14,000 a year in future values a year. That should be in front of people. When they think of their total inventory of finances, we very much believe that you should put not only the current income sources, but those that are in the future that they should be cognizant of and managing and thinking about that's gonna be there for them. In fact, one of the things that we've seen throughout the years is we talked about these special GMIB products or guaranteed withdrawal products um, have, have made a huge advance into the community of buyers and that they don't know what they bought. And so how are we communicating those, um, those assets and the benefit of holding them? And one of the things that you might notice here is that this on the right here is a non-qualified annuity for $280,000, a deferred annuity with an income benefit for up to $12,000 in the future that's showing here on Michael's asset map because this is relevant to the conversation. Unfortunately, we tend to leave it off. We do also see a good amount of qualified instruments commonly in the educational space or in the nonprofit space using annuities which uh, could also show, so that you know, the dotted line indicates that there's an annuity substructure inside of this asset. So where this is a qualified in red, green is non-qualified, the dotted line indicates in fact that it is an annuity and we should be using that to communicate, and bring attention to the fact that this may or may not be an appropriate holding piece for our clients uh, or our prospects. And it highlights the paycheck nature. Of the, of the absolutely right because that's why yeah. they're buying it mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I, I really try to promote and I hope that all of you are doing in the field when you're talking to people or even asking yourself is that we're all pretty much we think we're good buy side investors right we make we, we hopefully are buying with the right attitude with value right we're buying something that we think is going to be worth more is going to benefit us but I have seen that for the most part most of us are really crappy sellers Right? We don't necessarily know when to get out of something, whether it's an asset, an investment, maybe a relationship. But the bottom line is, is that we're not necessarily really skilled in the distribution strategy. And I think that's going to be the bigger question. So one of the things I promote is that advisors and professionals should be asking for each of these boxes that's on an asset map. What is the exit strategy? What's the exit plan for this IRA and a mutual fund that you have? Because very often it's not thought of. It's thought of that nest egg idea you brought up, Ramsey. Mm -hmm. It's thought of. Uh, it's this big pool of money and I've just take a little bit as I need it, right? That's not sustainable. We know that's true based upon the sequence of returns. We need to have a plan. And so if you at, look at these instruments and just simply ask the basic human question, uh, what am I, how am I going to take what I need from this account? It starts asking really important questions that are really relevant for, I think, a lot of consumers today. And they're not asking this question. Um, one of the fun things that we've been starting to ask questions differently is literally writing on people's asset map, how do I continue your paycheck uh, in retirement? How do I make sure uh, that you actually get your bills paid? M many of those responses are, well, that's what you're for. You're supposed to figure that out. It's a big math problem on our side as well, and we need, we need some help. Another thing that we're starting to see pop up is a good number of people, especially in the higher net worth, have a significant amount of cash value in life insurance policies that have built up, mostly purchased either because they were looking for long-term coverage or they were looking for the tax advantages sometimes provided inside of these plans. Uh, and a lot of people I'm surprised don't know that you can actually 1035 tax-free exchange from an, from an insurance policy to an annuity. So if you have an embedded high cost basis in a life insurance policy, in many cases, you can move that over to an income annuity get the advantages of the deferred taxes, uh, as well as pretty significant tax advantages, if in fact life insurance is not needed. So I think this is gonna wind up becoming a bigger topic. Again, if you see it on a map and you don't bring it up, it's, an op it's a missed opportunity to talk about source of funds. And we are still seeing a good number of boomers um, hit retirement with an existing mortgage. Um, and of course, if you understand a mortgage, then effectively you do understand an annuity. It's just the players are different. And I think we have an opportunity to educate our clients on how these things work 
with the caveat that ultimately in the reverse, this mortgage is never paid off. In other words, if you get this money for life, uh, you know, obviously if you're still breathing, they send you a paycheck. Um, another thing I thought that might make a lot of sense is to understand how we're tending to do this on the planning side. So if you use Asset Map, you already understand that our goal is to create a two or three page presentation for entire financial planning that leads with the Asset Map as I just showed you and any other instruments you might need, but it also includes the ability to tell if you're unfunded for major goals. And this is really critical today because people don't have the attention span to deal with an 80 page output. So what we really created was the ability to just tell somebody the bottom line, which is fundamentally how funded are you for retirement? And what is the composition of those sources of funds? The blue in this case happens to be guaranteed sources. I'll tell you that there's this kind of imaginary line at about 50 to 60% that really we've seen an indication that when clients have less than 50% of their income coming from guaranteed sources, they have this anxiety factor, which means they start making really bad decisions on their investment portfolio when the markets start giving them feedback albeit negative. So imagine it, right? My, my income is tied to my portfolio all of a sudden, or at least that's what I think. The market goes down, I start changing my spending, I make different investment decisions. We all know how that ends. That's clearly not smart. What should we be doing to communicating it? Well, we should be educating our customers. Hey, there's this point where we need to pay attention to it. Let's quantify how much income is coming from guaranteed sources and what is your ideal? And recently, we just are about to release um, the cash flow modules behind us for those of you technical people who've been bugging us to actually release this. We're about to do it. Um, and one of the things that I think is really kind of critical to communicate, especially to individuals early in retirement, is clearly you, know, you got to know or project what they're going to be spending on an after-tax basis. But certainly showing them that, uh, that some of these funds are actually going to be covered from guaranteed sources really has an emotional calming factor. And I've seen it again and again and again. I met with a family just yesterday, an old client of ours in the $20 million range, showing them this and showing that their income was secure for a portion of their funds really did enormous, surprisingly enormous amount of confidence building in our ability to deliver and also pay attention to their real needs, which is to have certainty. Of course, at the end of the day, we still need to send the money and knowing what that is is really critical. So for those of you using Asimap, you'll be able to tell somebody, Here's how much money I need to come up with to cover the difference from the portfolio. How we go about doing that is going to be a game time decision because we all know you can't figure out where you're going to spend money from 10 years from now. You don't even know what your expenses are going to be. So um, I think it's really important to kind of think about how we're going to communicate this to our customers. A complex concept, a generally talked about poorly in the market or in the news media, poorly. Um, but clearly a necessity for those individuals who want certainty and don't have the time to do over. Um, really important that we be, as advisors, I think, uh, really up to speed on how they work and where they're appropriate. I put together um, a significant amount of time, not just me, my whole team at Asset Map um, has put together a significant amount of information, just like this webinar. We have put it up on our webinar site. We will. Um, we've done over 30 hours, I think, now um, of webinars that you can go see today. There's no passwords. You can just go in and, and watch some of this stuff. I really recommend that you take some opportunity to go invest in your practice again. If you didn't know it exists, it does. And we've also taken some time to make sure that if you do want to get more information on annuity or engage with Ramsey's team, um, here's a link to his website, uh, alex.fyi. I really appreciate you being here, Ramsey. It's My always pleasure. a pleasure talking to somebody else who really knows their stuff.